And joining me here now on The Rich Eisen Show is the Oscar-winning director of AIR, exclusively in theaters globally, on uh, this coming Wednesday, April 5th. The man who also plays Phil Knight in this terrific film, Ben Affleck. How you doing, Ben? Good. Nice to see you. Always good, a pleasure. Good to see you, too. Uh, what attracted you to this film, the project? I mean, you know, it was kind of a lot of things at once. Um, I mean, first of all, obviously, I thought, you know, the story of, of what Michael Jordan kind of became and how he changed the sports world and the marketing world is one that I vividly remember. And I think is now is very interesting because it was it's really the beginning of a, of a total transition from people into sort of brands and the different identity marketing and all this stuff that, that we kind of take for granted now. Uh, and I thought it was really interesting that at the time, I, I wasn't quite aware that it wasn't taken for granted that Michael would be a great big star in the NBA or, 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 or not to mention become, you know, uh, the greatest, the greatest of all professional basketball players. And that Nike was like, kind of, you know, in third place, they were in the, you know, in the outhouse there, they were like pulling up the caboose in the basketball market, they were kind of a Portland, you know, uh, marathoning sort of slightly hippie alternative jogging company, but they weren't at all cool in that, in the basketball world. And they certainly weren't what they, what they later became. And I like the underdog aspect of it. And ultimately, I really like the kind of the way that it could maybe serve, be a kind of a fable. Like you don't have to like basketball the whole thing. Like you, if you like basketball and like sports, you should love it. And also it should feel universal. And it was a good opportunity for me to look selfishly, the kinds of movies I really like to make and I hope keep getting made are movies that are like about the characters and about the writing and the acting and where people's, you know, move you or funny or interesting or surprise you. And that's, um, you know, that's that's in short supply now. The, the kind of conventional wisdom is that that can't be out in theaters. So I was trying to trying to make a, a movie that crowds would like, my friends would like, my kids would like, my mom would like, but that didn't feel compromised in any way. Well, you stuck the landing on this one, man. I loved it. Um, right. And it, it uh, and I was, you know, saying it earlier and I'll say it again now that I'm with you. It, it, it felt like uh, five minutes long. It just breezed by. And then the, the best films where you already know the result, but still keep you on the edge of your seat. Like, I, like spoiler alert, I knew Nike was going to sign Jordan by the you end. Did, you did know that the year Jordan ended up being a thing. That was yeah. around, yeah, the You know what? I, I, I kind of knew that going in. Yeah. Um, but and You knew it panned out for him as a basketball player. It's amazing how it all happened. But, uh, and, and interestingly enough, you know, we, we're talking right now uh, just uh, mere hours after, uh, let me do the math in my head, the 41st anniversary of him making the shot to beat um, Georgetown. Nice. Um, and, you know, stand in Patrick Ewing's way for the first of about a dozen times in his career, in their career. Which I remember Patrick Ewing, we put a little sort of Easter egg in it, went to my high school uh, that I went to, that Matt and I went to, we, not, I wasn't old enough to be in high school, but everybody, you know, there, you know, knew, Hey, Pat, you, he lived down the street from us. He actually lived on Matt street, which we kind of go to a little bit, obviously great lengths at the end to sort of talk about unnecessarily, but it was, I remember that game because it was such a, a heartbreak because he, uh, you know, the guy got tightened, uh, threw the ball to the player on the other team. Yes. Uh, and it was, so it was a Floyd. big deal college game, even when we were young kids then. Yeah, the sleepy Floyd ending, and but yeah. it, but the fact that you know that play kind of put Jordan in the national consciousness, and that is so important for your film as well. Um, and now here we are, you know, at Final Four time. It is it is a pretty neat sort of confluence of everything together, and the footage, seeing it in the film, is is amazing. But that does bring me to my next question here: is you made clearly a conscious choice to not cast. Michael Jordan is a character and why yes. did you, why did you do that we we hard we never see his face yeah any, well for a couple of reasons one it's I don't have the rights to make the Michael Jordan story and the Michael Jordan if you're going to convince somebody if it's possible that you're going to be able to convince an audience that a different person than the Michael Jordan that everybody knows incredibly well because he's a, a kind of walking God on earth and a massive icon, you're going to have to get an actor like, you know, of, of, of the caliber of like, I mean, there are very few, Denzel and Malcolm X. When that movie ended and they showed Malcolm X, I was like, oh, 
oh, that's right. Malcolm X didn't look like Denzel. You know, like I thought Denzel was Malcolm X. You need a whole movie. You need a lot of work and you need like, you know, a career performance from a genius. And this also, you need the rights to Michael's story. Part of what this is about, part of what this company Matt and I are doing is about is, you know, the people that and what Nike recognize in that deal. If you're going to create that kind of value, you should be compensated appropriately. You know, it's the shift from a kind of license fee to some ownership share. And uh, that's why I thought like, A, no one's going to believe me that some actor shows up in the middle of the movie and I go, hey, there's Michael Jordan. It destroys the whole movie because all of a sudden everything else is bogus too, obviously. You know, it all just, it, it, these illusions, like making a movie, most of the work is sustaining the basic illusion that what you're watching is actually real and happening so that you invest yourself in it. That's the hardest part of it to stop people from going, oh, I knew this would happen or this is where this part, you know, where they disengage, but to actually connect them with people and trying to sell anybody who's not Michael Jordan, the only person who could play it, uh, the, you know, 23 year old Michael Jordan turned 60 yesterday and I can't afford him. And that's <laughs> But you did need said Michael's blessing, correct? You, you had to uh, I don't think the lawyers or anybody thought that, uh, like, because he's not in it. And because I think, you know, as I can tell you, like, when you're a public figure and I'm not of the, uh, not, not approaching uh, even close to Jordan public figure status, nonetheless, there are, like, your people are allowed to write things and say things and tell stories about you because you're considered to be kind of in the public sphere or the public domain or, the, you know, whatever the law is regarding that, it, it gives people some latitude to, you know, fair use and talk about your story. The truth of it was I wasn't going to make the movie without knowing. And, and first of all, saying, hey, Michael, if you don't want this movie made, period, no matter what, like, I'm just done. Forget it. I don't need to do it. I don't don't for, for out of respect for you and who you are and what you mean and out of the simple basic instinct of self preservation. Like the stupidest thing in the world would be to go out and 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 make a movie which you know then Michael later discovers is being made and says like this is an outrage. Get rid of this thing. Well, you know that's just suicide. And uh, so I just but I also was mindful that like I, we weren't paying him. This wasn't the Michael Jordan story, and so I didn't want to ask of him anything in right. terms of hey you know give me a work with me give me research blah 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 you know promote the movie like i you know i said listen i don't have to you know all i want you to know is if you tell me to not to just walk away and drop it i will and because i have to and i was lucky to get him to sit down with me for an hour frankly and he and i said look if you um, I need to compress this i need to change details when you tell a true story uh, a story inspired by true events it's in a less than two hours, you know, part of the function of telling that story is maintaining the essence of the truth, but it's not the literal truth and everyone didn't say exactly those things, etc. cetera. Um, you take liberties, but Michael, I won't, you know, if I wanna know what things are fundamentally important to you where if there are truths that are violated, it's, it, it just doesn't work for you. And um, it was a very, I think tellingly, his only, concerns were about others inclusion in the story it was like Howard White should not be left out it's an extremely important figure in this deal an ongoing relationship lifelong relationship with Mike Howard of course still there George Brand vice president uh George Raveling deal wouldn't happen without George Raveling that was good for me to know because this was after the Olympics that this story takes place George Raveling was the assistant coach Bobby Knight on the Olympic right. team um for those of you who want to see on YouTube there's a really great Bobby Knight talking about saying uh, I, I, then before he went to the pros, this is the best basketball player that's ever. ever that he's ever seen. And he, I've seen that where he says it's in terms of being a competitor, athletic, he, he called it before he, he ever really played called it. it. And he, by the way, like actually later on after the movie, what I found out, I saw an article in Forbes magazine in 1984 that said, if you, you need look no further for evidence that Nike has completely lost its way than the fact that they paid $250,000 to an untested Michael Jordan who's never played a day of professional Man, basketball. That to. exists. 250 that's grand. A, that's a cold take. That's a cold take. Didn't last, didn't age well. Forbes was wrong. <laughs> yeah. um, anyway, and Michael also talked about, uh, you know, his few, like saying things were also, he talked about his parents as I was, so, you know, obviously, if you don't want your parents to appear in it, I can, you know, out of respect, I knew his father passed away, you know, and I wanted to be respectful of his family. And I said, is there anything that you'd like to include? You wouldn't like to be included? Like, just, I just am not going to 
about this at all in any way other than the way that's respectful. Right. And he, uh, you know, he was he had a lovely, obvious affection for his uh, for his dad. He said he had the best personality of anyone he ever knew, and they talked quite um, uh, reverentially about his mother and 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 her role, uh, which I hadn't known about entirely. And instantly, when he told me that, I thought, like, okay, that this changes the whole movie. I'm going to reconstruct this whole story to reflect the fact that at like, you know, 59 years old, this is what Michael remembers about this incident and the person that he wants to, you know, pay homage to. And, uh, and then he told me I had to get Viola Davis. So <laughs> it was quite clear that I was like, yep, yeah, it's just like saying, you can start a basketball team if you had to get Michael Jordan. But uh, it, it meant that I had to, you know, come up with something that was worthy of Viola Davis. And so, and it was kind of, in a way, probably typical Michael Jordan, like, well, we'll just get the very best. You know what I mean? The absolute greatest ever. Terrific. No problem. It's right. So where, where did that take place? Did you, uh, I mean, you didn't. I, uh, you know, I told him I would like maintain the confidence. I went and met him at a, at a, uh, like, a, you know, semi, like a place we met and I went to him to where he's near where he lives. And you didn't said, just where you didn't just you didn't just show up at his house like Sonny Bacall. I didn't call him. I know. I said, "Where would you like me to come?" And I will come there anywhere in the world. Right. And he said, "This is where I am." And meet me down the road. And I said, "Okay, great." And and I was really like grateful and 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 really just grateful and happy that he was like willing to take the time and sit down with me and have a conversation because we, he didn't have to at all. And I know he's right. famously a guy who guards his his private time and his private life. Well, and Ben Affleck here on the Rich Eisen Show, and you know, obviously you've been there, done that. You've been around uh, this city, and obviously you've been around sports, and you've combined them both before in other films. Um, you know, you're you're friendly with Brady. I mean, where, what was it like meeting with him? Just to linger on Jordan. I mean, what was that? I had you? met Michael a few other times. Okay. Uh, you know, sort of at events, and uh, you know. Uh, around so i i knew him a little bit it, not like you know we we're like you know he's my butt you know i totally like idolize the guy and hero worship him and you know would meet him and try to act cool and then be like look at the boy, look. you know <laughs> and this was very much like that he's a uh, extraordinary he got an incredible presence and a, an incredible uh, he got a very deep you know powerful voice speaking voice yeah uh which is interesting because i watched a letterman interview uh from his second year in the nba i think it was and where they talk about some of the events in the movie, in particular about the NBA's approach to the shoe. And he doesn't, he, it's really fascinating how much he seemed to kind of grow into that icon status thing, you know, because now to meet him is to, is to really experience in a way, and I've met a lot of famous people and, you know, whatever. And, and I would say he's the most personally impressive person I've ever met. You know, he just kind of exudes a... A, a, a power and a strength and a kind of a force and a determination and a confidence that are self-evident and and you know you you meet the guy and you think this is a person to be respected and taken very seriously and and uh, that was that was my approach and I was thrilled he was kind he was nice he was friendly and I you know um, I was flattered. No, I'm glad he said yes. Um, so in the few minutes I have left with you, what? how did you prepare as if you didn't have enough to bite off directing this and, and meeting with Jordan and helping make it happen? How, how did you prepare for Phil Knight playing another icon? In well, this interestingly, the, the Jordan meeting, although brief, you know, actually was the catalyst for what ended up being a, a, a very, you know, laborious reconstruction of, of the movie in many ways. The Phil, Phil, there was, and no one was playing Mike, which I, as I said, I think would be impossible. Uh, with Phil, it was kind of like, you know, I didn't want to try to SNL, you know, where I get the exact, you know, mimic the look and the, you know, and, and try to, I wanted to sort of capture the spirit, but Jason Bateman doesn't look a lot like Rob Strasser and Chris Messina doesn't look like David Falk and, yes. you know, but I knew that Phil is, is famous and well known and his hair actually was a little more blonde than I did the but I wanted it to sort of not be like I had a blonde wig in the last duel and that was the only thing that seemed, anybody seemed to talk about so it was like maybe I won't do that this time maybe I'll do a less distracting move and I really was interested and drawn to the fact that like Phil's a very complex guy 
He's, he built this huge company. He's this massive titan of industry. He real like revolutionary and sort of pirate. And then he became like a steward of the ship. And that's an interesting thing. And also just being like a Buddhist and a massive capitalist are <laughs> odd things that are in contrast with one another. And I thought, and the truth is you have to have somebody in the story, like the true story of this deal, I'm sure is much more nuanced than probably a little more boring and a lot of conference rooms and discussions about it. But the, I, you have to have somebody who, who has some resistance to the protagonist's, you know, movement forward. And also the truth is like people love to make fun of the boss. You know, like in my experience, you know, that's just how we are. Uh, and, and I thought this is a guy who would both uh, ha get a lot of respect for what he'd done, but also you could see people working with him going like, this guy's going to preach to me about Buddhism now and lecture me about, you know, and give that, that kind of energy and tenor and spirit to what I thought it felt like Nike might have been at that time, which is a sort of scrappy place with a bunch of people trying to sort of change the rules. And, you know, they had a philosophy. Companies didn't have philosophies companies their philosophy was like you you know punch the clock and make a profit it wasn't like you went down to the tire factory and was like but what's your mission statement you know and now this is the era of the modern corporation is like whether they do or don't have you know philosophies they all have consultants who say here's what we think works as a mission statement you know and and phil kind of uh, was an early pioneer in that and and so i tried to play him in a kind of funny appealing and and tip the hat to the significance of the decision he made and also a guy who could like i hoped you know take a joke which it turned out he could it's amazing uh last two for you here ben affleck um it's great also to see you and and uh matt on the screen together doing your thing um so it begs the question have you ever had the opportunity to do a sequel to goodwill hunting have you ever had the offer to do that uh it's it it's been explored uh, people have inquired. I don't have an idea that uh, I think is good enough to, I don't know what that would be. It just seems like that movie is sort of what it is. And if it would feel like a kind of, you know, cash grab trivialization of a movie that is like of the few that are, are important to me. I really love, I like the, one of the few movies I wanted my kids to see, you know, it's, uh, there are things about it that now feel a little bit like, yeah, that was the nineties, you know, but uh, mm -hmm. I still love the movie, you know, it was it, it, in that movie is a spirit of me and Matt as kids and trying to grow up, become young men and figure the world out. And uh, it's, it's like a lovely thing, nostalgic thing for me now. So I, it's not like I'm going to, you know, I want to have Will now, like, you know, you know, he works at NASA and he's, uh, you know, breaking, hacking into the Chinese database and or whatever, you know. So he would, he would be like born. You'd, he'd, you'd turn him into Jason. <laughs> he actually, Jason actually Bourne kind hunting? of is Jason born now that I think about it. He just Jason forgot Bourne that hunting. he grew up in South Boston. Yeah. And mixed it all together. And then uh, last one for you, you know, you, you mentioned earlier, uh, you know, spoiler alert, you're in the public eye. Um, and to just, you know, mix it all together with your film about uh, a star athlete having his mother acting as an advocate for him. Uh, Lamar Jackson is currently out there right now uh, looking maybe for another team. Um, his mother is apparently his agent. And then in the meantime, he's been, you know, hearing all sorts of things about him that's not true on social media. Did you see that he used you as a meme on his Twitter account? Ben I Affleck? didn't. I didn't talk to you. He said uh, it, it's like he was talking about how you need mental health awareness. And then he put you in his jersey caught smoking outside of a uh, outside, you know, this famous photograph of you looking. That, is a, that is a lovely. And I wish it were, I weren't smoking because I don't really want to promote okay. that awful. Foul. Goes, However, however I do. My daughter told me uh, who's now uh, 17 years old. Yes. She said, Dad, you know, I think your real lasting cultural contribution will be as representative of the beleaguered man. <laughs> I don't think the beleaguered man needs a representative, but now they have one. I think like, well, it's interesting because it's like, yes, I, I have kind of like, I don't even remember what, that was just like a moment. I was kind of like, oh, I'm tired. But it, it becomes like a, and by the way, I'm sure that the point he's trying to make, yes. we might guess, is like, life is hard for all of us. Yes. It is a difficult thing to navigate. And uh, we all can feel, I, I, I don't even know the details of what's going on. I don't right. try to defend or advocate, but yes. my guess, my hope is that it's saying like, life's not easy. 
and uh, it's not a, and, and they say it can be hard no matter who you are and, uh, you know, sort of like be a little more compassionate. And if that is in fact his message, then I wholeheartedly concur. And I, there are a host of other beleaguered man <laughs> which, uh, he's uh, welcome to uh, use. You look good in a Ravens uniform, though. I don't know if you ever thought you'd look good in a Ravens uniform, but uh, I well, having met Ray Lewis, I'll tell you what I, I actually, if I was standing next to another <laughs> Raven, I think I would not look quite so good. It's like this: those some of those right. you see guys in the NFL who are built in a way that is just, you know, it's a whole other level. Oh yeah, absolutely. Hey, congrats on air. Ben, it really is a fantastic movie. I could not, speaking of advocating, I couldn't advocate uh, for more people to see it. It's really awesome. And I'm going to show it to my kids. As you pointed out, you want to show your kids. Uh, my, my kids only know of Jordan as the shoe guy. That's the way it is in this world, man. You know, in the same way did John Madden as the video game guy for a whole generation. Yeah, Madden um, is like, but, they think he wrote the code. You know, right. yeah, he's, a, he's the algorithm guy you know yeah. but but uh it, it tells a, a full and complete story and it's awesome it's fun you're yeah. fun in it and it's great I so, it, and That's i thank you for taking the time here to uh come always on. a pleasure to talk to my man i thank appreciate you. you right back you. at you ben affleck thanks all again all right talk that's, to you ben, that's ben affleck right here on the rich eisen show catch the rich eisen show every single day on the roku channel 12 to 3 eastern for free 